Okay, w welcome everyone. Um, this so I'm. This is panel H, which hopefully you're here for, which is quantified self and capitalist value. And uh, I'm going to be chairing the panel, uh, and I'll be talking first in a moment. And then we'll have um, Karen McEwen um, talking about bit walking, and uh, Elena Marchevska uh, talking about uh, intimacy and uh, net art work. Um, and so I think how we're doing it is uh, we'll be each speaking individually and then all taking questions uh, at the end, uh, so 20 minutes each. Uh, so I'll start with mine. So uh, I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing around the use of self-tracking um, in workplace wellness, corporate wellness programs, um, and make some suggestions about um, how I think uh, subjects, identities, sort of users are being constructed through this process. Uh, my focus is on um, kind of looking up at how the, the, the companies uh, and perhaps the managers uh, are viewing this rather than looking uh, at the, um, the individuals and the users themselves. So I'm not making any claims about how users of these devices see themselves or it's more how they're being seen or how they're being constructed. Um, and I'm going to suggest um, a certain lens of uh, analysing this through thinking about it in terms of attempts at psychic programming. So the um, most people are probably aware of some of these kinds of uh, initiatives. Uh, what I'm talking about is um, corporate wellness initiatives, which are obviously designed to try and improve the health or well-being of, uh, of workers using self-tracking um, means. Um, so uh, the, the two that I'm focusing on are, are Virgin Pulse and Global Corporate Challenge, who have actually now, uh, in the last few months, merged into one. Um, and they were previously the biggest providers of these individually, and so now they, they, they I think they definitely are. Uh, and how these work, people are probably um, familiar with some of this stuff, is that it tends to be that employees get provided with uh, a, a tracker of some description. That's what I think the Virgin Pulse one looks like, or certainly used to look like. Uh, or some people can use their own devices, Fitbits or um, Apple Watches, all that kind of thing. Uh, and they track their steps, and they get plugged into a, a, an online platform, and they get advice and nudges and encouragements and this kind of thing. And it's all part of a broader wellness initiative as well. But usually they also get, uh, form teams of six or seven people and compete um, for which team can um, walk the most steps. Um, and steps are also calculated in terms of swimming and cycling and these kinds of things. Compete against other teams in their organization and, and around the world. They get put into leaderboards and this kind of thing. So these, these are the initiatives that I'm, uh, I'm specifically talking about. What I'm going to do is kind of pick apart um, what they say, how, they wor how their initiatives work, um, why they're beneficial, and to, also and to suggest um, what this might mean. So they make various claims about what they can do, that they can produce a culture of health, p productivity, improve morale, this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm focusing on one particular aspect of this, which I, I think is perhaps the central bit, is this uh, issue of stronger engagement. Um, and what I think that they're, they're suggesting is that they can, um, they can improve employee engagement, which has become a big issue uh, in, in, um, for management recently. And this is by way of a definition of employee engagement. This is a Dilbert cartoon where the boss says, we need more of what the management experts call employee engagement. I don't know the details, but it has something to do with you idiots working harder for the same pay. Dilbert says, is anything different on your end? The boss says, I think I'm supposed to be happier. Um, <laughs> And but the in engagement, employee engagement has become a really big issue um, in management um, because they need to get people to be productive, but they can't do that really through kind of standing over them with a stick. They need to uh, kind of maybe seduce or encourage people in, into being more productive through being more engaged. Um, a more kind of uh, 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 serious definition uh, of employee engagement is an employee's positive emotional attachment to their job and or colleagues and or organization, which profoundly influences their willingness to learn and perform at work. But this is also often really connected with health uh, and wellness. So another is healthy employees are more committed, committed employees are more healthy. Um, these are seen as going together. Commitment to at work is almost a, a, a signifier of being healthy and vice versa. And also the notion that highly engaged individuals with high levels of well-being are the most productive and the happiest employees. So these things are all kind of seen, being seen as part of the same, uh, the, the, the same thing. Uh, and I think that th this is one of the main targets of these, um, th these initiatives, rather necessarily than um, improving health. Um, but th it's the way that they go about um, trying to achieve this, uh, which I think reveals a certain way of understanding um, what they're doing. So I think that the, the, the tactics that they're using is uh, developing habit formation through network manipulation. 
So I'll, these are the two main issues I'm going to kind of unpick. And these are kind of models which are suggest explicitly suggested by, by these two programs. Um, so I'll talk about habit formation first. So this is from Global Corporate Challenge. Um, and this is what they suggest how their initiative works, which is a, a habit loop. Um, and so the idea is you get a cue from your device, um, which might, be, it might give you a little buzz and say you've only walked 5,000 steps. You need to do 10 um, for some reason. Um, and so it gives you a nudge. So you think, OK, I'll go for a walk or a run. So you do that. You get a reward, which is a virtual trophy, or you go up the leaderboard or whatever else. Um, and that creates a, a habit loop. And you get into this kind of habit. Uh, and they get this idea um, from a book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Um, that's Charles Duhigg. Um, and what we'll see is really actually the models that are behind these, I think, are basically um, they're not terribly scientific or anything, but they're, they're taken from basically pop science books. It's kind of the ideas of pop science airport authors um, that are behind these kinds of things. So he wrote this book called The Power of Habit. And um, he developed this idea of a habit loop. It, it's kind of built on other things, but uh, they, they explicitly cite him. And so Q routine reward or Q habit reward is, is how um, he thinks everything in our lives work. Um, we are uh, caught in all these habit loops. Um, everything about us from tying our shoelaces to uh, writing a novel is all about habit loops. Uh, we're kind of these automatic creatures. Um, and he thinks the only way um, we can't do anything about that, we can just intervene into the, uh, and, and try to produce new habits. But also, he thinks that it's, this is a positive way. It's a really positive thing. Doing things in a habitual way is positive because it's the most efficient, it's the most effective way to do it. So he, in his book, he has all these examples, um, like sports examples, uh, some American football team that use the kind of approach he's talking about. Um, and it's, they were, they were the, this really good uh, team, apparently, because they, the players didn't think about what they were doing. They just did it. They just responded. They didn't think, I'm going to pass this ball over there or run in that direction. They just knew that that's what they had to do because it had been drilled into them. And so everything about human beings is, is habit, basically, according to him. Um, and, but crucial to this is his, uh, this idea that the brain can be reprogrammed. Um, with this massive loops, but we can reprogram this. Um, we reprogram this through um, intervening in keystone habits. And exercise is a keystone habit. Uh, it's something which naturally starts to make you think about and make other changes in your life. And that's because of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, which is a real thing, um, apparently. Um, but it, no, it's, um, it's, it's a, a kind of a neurochemical process which apparently occurs in the brain. This is from the GCC website as well. Um, it acts like fertilizer for your brain's neurons, makes them grow quicker and develop stronger connections. You learn new skills, develop habits more easily. By being active, it becomes a platform to build other habits around. So you, you start exercising more, and then you almost automatically start eating healthier and sleeping better uh, and working, hard, working better and more effectively and, and making more friends and you're just generally better. And so there's this, um, it's a kind of a, a, a chain reaction. Um, but crucially, it's because your, your brain makes c more connections. Um, and uh, this notion of making connections in this kind of network is something we'll come back to in a moment, this kind of metaphor. Um, but that, that's, that's how it works. But it's this kind of automatic process, really. Now, on to the, the, the second bit. Um, so um, this is more explicitly from the Virgin Pulse um, model. They, um, they get one of their key ideas for how their initiative works from um, someone called Nicholas Christakis, who people might have heard of, who wrote a book called Connected. Um, and he is a, uh, he's a medical sociologist. I think it really his background is medicine, then he got into sociology. He, I can't remember which way around. He either used to be at Yale, now he's at Harvard, or the other way around, and he left in under quite do um, dodgy circumstances. But um, he, um, he's actually, um, he's a, so he's an academic and he's a researcher, and he gets published in Nature and, and those kinds of um, uh, uh, August journals. But also, um, he's on the payroll at Virgin Pulse as well. And he writes these kind of reports, sort of white papers for them, which are effectively kind of puff pieces. But um, what's behind his, his, his kind of um, philosophy, you can see this in, he, he does TED Talks and that kind of thing, um, is that um, human societies are um, what he calls uh, like a human super organism. So they're, um, um, they're almost like an organism in themselves, a kind of the networked uh, kind, of, kind of society of human beings. And what he found is that um, human behaviors and also um, ideas um, spread through networks, um, sort of like a disease. 
uh, like an, or like a, uh, an, epide an epidemic kind of disease. And so he's kind of, through mathematical modeling and things, he's looked at how um, obesity uh, gets distributed, how happiness gets distributed, uh, and he thinks this applies to pretty much everything. Um, it, but it gets distributed around kind of clusters. So uh, each of those dots in each of those cases is an individual person, uh, and then there's the connections. It's kind of related to kind of uh, network analysis. Um, and so um, obesity spreads through these kind of clusters, as does happiness uh, and these kinds of things. Um, um, and h how he sees it is actually individual human beings are like uh, atoms. He, uh, this is the metaphor he uses. Um, and the structure of the overall network is determined by how, in his words, how you arrange the atoms in the same way as if you arrange um, carbon atoms in one way, you get um, graphite or, or something. If you arrange them in another way, you get diamond. Um, so the overall structure determines how, how they're organized. Um, and this is the kind of the model on which uh, Virgin Pulse um, supposedly based their, their system. Um, so he says, there are two broad ways to intervene in networks, by manipulating connection or by affecting contagion. Increasingly, we have examples of both, applied to workers, customers, patients. Uh, by manipulating online network structures, you can affect health behaviors, or you can manipulate structures of social network ties, which can affect cooperation behaviors online or offline. How nice people are to each other depends on how we arrange the ties among them. So, um, but the, the focus here is, is obviously is towards the manager or the, 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 um, the person in charge. He's been in influential in policy circles as well. He's advised governments kind of connected with the kind of the nudge idea and this kind of thing. So it, it's, it's focused on, on those people who are, it's, um, also who are arranging the ties amongst people, kind of c controlling them. Um, and th the individuals are, are atoms. They're not really active. They're just uh, reactive to the, um, the circumstances and the, 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 the connections. Um, so this is from one of the, the kind of the, the uh, white papers that he, he wrote for Virgin Pulse. Um, so these are intervention tactics for changing behavior. So as we've discovered, it's possible to use mathematical algorithms to identify key people who, if we improve their health practices, induce everyone else to copy them. That's kind of how it works, this kind of network effect. And so we're, we're, um, we're evaluating different mathematical procedures to see which method of targeting works best. So we're saying that we can find these, we can mathematically determine the ways to, th the, the correct people to intervene, uh, who will then um, distribute their, 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 their kind of um, behaviors around the, the rest of the network. But even those individuals who are influential, it's not that they're influential in a kind of a, a, an active way, it's just that people copy them because they have lots of network ties effectively. So it's people in the, s um, so he does all analysis of kind of uh, measures of um, centrality and these kind of centrality to the network. So often if you're central to the network, that means you'll be influential. So he says, for example, it might make sense to identify just 10% of people who are right in the middle of a densely connected web, or it could turn out to be more effective to find 20% of people who are more loosely connected at the periphery. The science of networks can help us save money and potentially save lives, especially when resources like vaccines and doctors are scarce. But th that's written in a paper that's not, it's not a paper for public health workers, it's a paper for managers who are looking at buying a, a, a wellness in a, um, program. Um, but the point is, it's you find the in, uh, influential nodes uh, or atoms um, and you target them and then their, their beliefs kind of spread out. And of course, you can see how this might, ident this might uh, appeal to managers or others who, um, who are looking to um, um, get an effect, which is, which is kind of cheap as well. So um, what they suggest, um, this is um, more general kind of advertising for Virgin Pulse, is you can unify your workforce with social and mobile. You can harness the power of social networks through their, their system. Um, and so what I'd suggest is kind of going on here is that um, they're claiming that they can kind of connect. Um, that it, it's, it's kind of a way of um, making this kind of this imagination of the, of the network that they have. Because um, of course this is an idealized version of what human relations are like. Um, he, he talks about, obviously, it, uh, in his stuff on happiness, it tends to be just people with more network ties uh, that are happier. Uh, so people with six friends tend to be happier than if they've only got kind of one friend and this kind of thing. Um, but I mean, I, th that only works in a very idealized way in terms of defining who your friends are. I, I couldn't tell you how many friends I have um, because I don't know how I define all the people in my life, but it, it, it does it. But um, when, it's, when you connect people up with a device, um, then you can have a more solid idea of what their connections are because it's been all accumulated in uh, the data. So I think that they're kind of um, 
the imaginary of the network, the digital network, is kind of um, is reflecting back on on this as well. Um, but what I suggest is um, there's a certain model of the subject that they're kind of assuming and also trying to construct here. And I suggest this is a kind of an automatic subject in a way. And to, so to try to understand this, I'm I've I'm applying the work of um, Bernard Stiegler. Um, who is a philosopher who's interested in our relationship with technologies in, in really broad terms. And what he suggests is that the way in which we um, engage our memory, um, externalize our memory, um, is central to what it means to be, kind of, uh, to be a human being. And so this is, this is the process of what he calls tertiary retention, kind of putting our thoughts into something else. Uh, so whether that's into writing or music or, or, or art or whatever. And this actually helps to d define what we are as a, as a human being as well. Um, and, but for most of human history, uh, the way in which we uh, engage with tertiary retention, putting our thoughts into external things such as writing, um, worked in a certain kind of way. Uh, which changed in really in the 20th century with the invention of what he calls industrial temporal objects, things like television, film, recorded music, and that kind of stuff. And we engage with these things in a, in a different way to the way in which we engage with, with writing, for instance, um, because um, they are, as he says, temporal objects. They so engage with time and rhythm and this kind of stuff. Or the rhythm in which we reassimilate that knowledge back into us, that, that kind of looping process. Because when you're reading a book, you're relatively in control of how much the, the, the rate at which you um, assimilate that, that, that uh, data or that information into you. But uh, the, uh, the, with the, tempo the industrial temporal object, it's kind of, you're kind of passive, relatively speaking. Um, and that's kind of, maybe that's kind of one of the pleasures. Um, but this has an, Im uh, an impact on, on how we think as well, he suggests. So books uh, or reading text um, requires long circuits of attention, what he suggests. Um, basically, it takes a long time. You have to sit with it and engage with it over a long period and read it and, and, uh, and really think about it. And, um, as opposed to digital, um, well, industrial temporal objects and particularly kind of digital devices and things, um, encourage short circuits of attention. Um, literally, they short circuit the attention um, process. Uh, and the problem with this is, for, for Stiegler, is that um, long circuits of attention um, encourage what he thinks about in a Kantian way is kind of maturity, that they encourage the um, um, uh, encourage critique uh, and questioning um, and, and, and uh, reflective thought, whereas short circuits of attention encourage reactivity um, and kind of um, multitasking kind of skills, not a kind of um, a mat what he thinks about as, as kind of mature thought. Um, and I suggest that these kinds of models are working on that kind of basis of constructing a, a, a kind of a, a reactive subject um, rather than um, one that's uh, critical and reflective and, uh, and, and, and questioning and this kind of thing. Um, the assumption is that we're in these habit loops that we just kind of we just react and respond. Um, uh, we get a cue, we go for a run, then we um, get rewarded for it. Um, and, and also the assumption that this is positive, this is the most effective way to do that. Um, and when you situate that kind of that model inside the network is, is actually the reason why they want to connect us up to these networks is because we think we'll react and respond in a relatively automatic way um, through the network because that's uh, in the same way that a disease gets passed around a, um, um, uh, a population. And th there's, no, there's not a kind of a, an active creative subject there. Um, and so... This is from uh, Global Corporate Challenge. What they say is, what we need to do is help people to get a state of get to a state of flow more readily. Someone, I know someone's talking about flow later. Um, that's probably in a slightly different way to how these uh, these guys talk about it. Um, this is their kind of ideal subject. Someone who's in a state of flow, which they kind of understand something like this: it refers to a state of harmonious consciousness, goal-oriented, and in which people want to pursue an activity for its own value. Attention is devoted to the task at hand with a sense of timelessness. Other concerns and even pain are forgotten. Flow creates a state of joyous, self-forgetful involvement. So that's the kind of worker that they want. Um, not someone who's thinking and critiquing and, and questioning uh, the boss or anything like this, but someone who's, who's kind of totally taken over with the task and not really thinking about it, who's just responsive and reactive. And so what I suggest that this is, that they're, they're trying to construct, is um, a sort of ideal capitalist subject 
the definition of which I've taken from uh, Gray and Delay, who say the ideal capitalist subject is one which functions without receiving its orders from consciousness. Thus, the machine moves by itself. So it's this kind of automatic um, subject who's it fully integrated with the machinery of uh, capitalism um, in order to be the as productive and efficient um, as possible. Thanks. That's it. Okay. Hi. Thanks so much um, for having me here, the organizers and all the folks behind the scene. Really delighted to be here. Um, so the research that I'm talking about today is on an app called Bitwalking, and this research is a, uh, it's in its early stages, definitely a work in progress, and it's a side project of my dissertation research, which more broadly examines the different economies of self-tracking. Sorry, just one second. There we go. Um, so the dissertation research more broadly examines the different economies of self-tracking, so how self-tracking technologies and data participate in the generation of value in different settings, including labor discipline and insurance programs. Um, I mean, I'm interested in the economization of daily experience, and in particular, I'm interested in how value is differentially assigned to bodies and activities along lines of race, class, gender, and location. So my interest in bitwalking kind of follows those lines, but it is a, a side project. So I'll be talking about that here. Sorry, I'm just trying to coordinate slides, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, so bitwalking is an app founded in London in 2015, and the app administers a virtual currency whose units are called bitwalking dollars. And this currency is generated by users through data inputs garnered from step counting devices and apps, so such as um, a mobile phone with the Google Fit app. Uh, so users sign up for a Bitwalking account, which they grant access to their step counting apps, and the step counting data is then used to fuel the creation of a Bitwalking of the Bitwalking currency units at the rate of one Bitwalking dollar per ten thousand steps to a max of three Bitwalking dollars per day. So Bitwalking dollars can then be used in the Bitwalking store, where users can buy things like a new uh, fitness tracker. They can be used with third-party partners. So for example, users in Malawi can reportedly at least use it to pay for internet access via Skyband Malawi. And uh, they can be traded or transferred among users. So just to explain this a bit more, because it's a bit weird. Um, in many ways, Bitwalking's currency is a lot like other virtual currencies, such as Bitcoin, in that it's produced and distributed over a network of connected users. However, Bitcoin generates currency by what they call bit mining, which is tasking computers connected through a network with solving co complex mathematical problems, which are then rewarded with a string of characters that serves as a unique unit of currency, so a Bitcoin. Um, so this currency unit can then be circulated and traded within the network and be exchanged with other external currencies. And bitwalking replaces the bit mining process, so that solving of computational problems, with the production of step counting data. So because of the complexity of the computational problems and the necessary computing power required, the costs associated with the production of virtual currencies like Bitcoin can be prohibitive. Bitwalking's founders therefore argue that they are democratizing the world of virtual currencies by making it accessible to anyone with a smartphone. They state, quote, Bitwalking is a new way to participate in the world, a technology that walks with us, that recognizes our human value, a new global currency generated by each of us for all of us. So they've targeted the app at the Global South and it originally launched in Malawi and Kenya. So my consideration of the economies of bitwalking through this lens this of this broader project on the economies of self-tracking is an attempt to understand how bitwalking works, which is to say its technical functioning, of course, but also the financial, social, and political economies that this technology relies on, whether explicitly or implicitly. So what does it mean for bitwalking to, in its founder's own words, convert human movement to currency? There's an initial impulse, I think, at least on my part, to understand bitwalking through the lens of digital labor. So the provision of a free service which generates data that can be sold as a commodity, which is that kind of Google or Facebook model. Um, while bitwalking's privacy policy in terms of service don't technically allow for this, it's not to say it 
isn't or wouldn't happen. They, you know, they wouldn't be the first company to find a way around their own terms of service. And as we were talking about yesterday, those can be very vague. Um, and we might also understand bitwalking as part of real subsumption, so this capturing and making productive of every moment, every movement, literally in this case, of daily life, uh, bringing life itself into the service of the circulation of capital. But economization, as Michelle Murphy reminds us, is not only about monetization or commodification, rather it's about the, quote, practices that assign value for the sake of the macro economy. More importantly, economization involves and indeed depends on the differential assignation of value amongst people and categories of people. As Neferti Tadir writes, though life has indeed become productive for capital, it is important to emphasize that not all life is valorized or valorizable, that the extraction of value from life takes place through more than one modality, and that life in the complex dynamics of capitalist processes assumes radically contradictory forms. So it's this differential assignation of social, political, and cultural value that enables the mobilization of daily life for financial profit. So I'm asking not only how are these self-tracking practices economized, but how are they economized differently for different people in different parts of the world, in different ways, and how are these differences um, integral to, not secondary, but integral to these modalities of economization. So Jane Geyer calls these differences asymmetries, be asymmetries between spheres of exchange and writes that when one scale of value or one way of assigning value is not reducible to the terms of another, a margin for gain lies in the negotiation of situational matching. Um, so it's in those moments um, when multiple different spheres of exchange or economies, um, ways of ordering and ranking actors and activities, when they're brought into contact, uh, it takes work to make these economies communicate and to translate between them or to convert. And at those sites of conversion, there lies possibility for capturing value. So when bitwalking describes itself as converting human movement to currency, there's something going on in addition, I think, to this production of and potential sale of data. What work is involved in this conversion? What differences between people, between movements, and between currencies matter and make this conversion possible and profitable? So there are two sites of conversion here that I want to talk about briefly. The first lies in the tension between uh, universality and locality in bitwalking. So the company's founders repeatedly emphasize the universality of the step as the driving force of bitwalking dollars. They write that, quote, a step is worth the same value for everyone, no matter who you are or where you are. In addition to rendering the creation of virtual currencies more accessible, bitwalking's potential, they argue, lies in its ability to create what they call an alternative financial ecosystem available to those who don't have adequate access to mainstream banking systems. Furthermore, the step-based format of the currency's generation may benefit users, uh, quoting, in, in poorer countries where people have to walk further for work, school, or simply to connect, collect water. Um, so this is the reasoning that underlies the founder's decision to launch in Malawi and Kenya. Certainly, this assumption of a universal bodily experience denies the very different ways that mobility is experienced. Not everyone steps and not everyone steps in the same way. And even among those of us who do step, however, the value of a step within bitwalking system relies on other crucial differences. So there's a generative but hidden tension at the heart of bitwalking structure, which becomes visible where the bitwalking alternative financial ecosystem intersects with existing financial systems, those it both seeks to disrupt and disrupt and relies upon. So what I mean by this is that a step measured in bitwalking dollars may be worth the same regardless of location, but the value of three bitwalking dollars per day, that maximum, and the necessity to walk farther as part of daily life is certainly not, and 30,000 steps is a lot, um, is certainly not equally distributed across the world. The very fact that three bitwalking dollars will be more likely to transform lives in their world, their word, uh, words in the global south stems from the difference between the value of a bitwalking dollar within the context of different existing localized financial economies. So bitwalking self-representation in interviews and publicity and um, social media, some of which is on these slides, um, in this self-representation, their emphasis on universality and democratization flattens this difference, a difference that I'd instead like to explore, explore through its ties to geographic location, to colonial histories of development, and to global flows of capital. So that's sort of where that this project is hopefully going. 
Um, because it seems to me that the process by which this universal currency is produced is in fact deeply embedded in local financial economies, but that the discourse of universality, the work that it does, is crucial in tying the moral economy of changing lives to the financial economy of producing and circulating the virtual currency. So this moral economy is underlain by the ideology of disruption prevalent in, in startup culture, which Brittany Fuhrgartland and Gina Neff describe as, quote, the perceived ability of technologies to upend the status quo of power within established industries and social institutions, frequently by attempting to redraw professional and occupational boundaries, relationships, and previously held notions of expertise, responsibility, and authority. So in other words, this discourse of disruption relies on claims of a moral force driving the tech-savvy global north to redraw the boundaries and relationships of power in order to open these sources of power to the tech-impoverished global south. That's the discourse, I think, that's at work here. So part of understanding the economization at work in bitwalking therefore requires that we critically place it within the history of economic development, I think in scare quotes, as a process of integrating the global south into flows of capital, not in spite of, but through the colonial moral economy. A claim that the other must be civilized, developed, technologized, and digitized, and that we do so for the sake of democracy and of equality. So this integration also involves the cultivation of subjectivities suitable for the capitalist production of value. One of the things I'm interested in understanding is how Bitwalking's disruption of the financial economy of virtual currencies uh, fits into this history. How can Bitwalking be understood as part of a process that yields data subjects or datafiable subjects who will work to make themselves algorithmically readable? So this leads me to this second aspect or second tension um, within bitwalking that I want to talk about a little bit, which is um, the tension between its openness and its modes of regulation or control. So bitwalking is very careful to note that they do not pay users to walk, nor do they run a reward system. Rather, they provide the platform through which users generate a currency. So this is an interesting deviation from or maybe addition to that digital labor model of understanding digital economies. Um, and again, that the economization of step, count, step counting is partly about the production and sale of data, but not simply an exchange of either a free service or money even, um, or virtual currency for user data. It's more fundamentally here, I think, about the creation of an economic network. So in a December 2016 email to its users, Bitwalking wrote that they are, quote, now building the value, the community, and the network to sustain the Bitwalking currency. And they call this process being in mining mode. So they're mining people. Like other virtual currencies, bitwalking needs to grow by bringing in more actors in order to sustain itself. This means attracting more users to generate the currency, but also more companies who will accept the currency uh, as, as genuine. And again, like other virtual currencies, bitwalking functions through its circulation. It requires this network of actors, individuals, and companies to invest in the currency, to assume the task of circulating it, in order to render it valuable and viable. While well, bitwalking must be open to, uh, and, indeed, and, and indeed must seek out or mine, in their words, more users, the platform also has to regulate the activities of those users to maintain the integrity of the currency. So productivity, in this case through the generation of the currency, overlaps with and in fact requires a lived embodied experience, of course. Um, the possibility that users might hack their devices, for example, to fraudulently generate steps could be a potential concern for the bitwalking economy. So just as Bitcoin has to verify the uniqueness of the identity um, of its own currency unit, so that string of characters that comprise a, a Bitcoin, um, bitwalking also has to verify the step as the fundamental unit that drives this conversion of human movement to currency. So the integrity of the generation mechanism in both cases has to be preserved or, or regulated in order to maintain and regulate the currency as a whole. And this requires a whole lot of labor. So for Bitcoin, this work uh, is crowdsourced amongst the network of computers as part of um, the trade-off for participating in the Bitcoin economy. And in bitwalking, the value of the step is determined by the platform's proprietary algorithms, of course, which are, quote, designed to maintain the consistency of the bitwalking ecosystem. And they range from uh, basic step verification through currency stability limitations to advanced fraud, sorry, fraud, fraud prevention techniques. 
So what interests me here is not just the algorithmic verification processes themselves, although I think those could be very interesting, um, but also the decentralized work of making our steps worth the same value within Bitwalking's economy. How is this work distributed amongst the currency's economic network, albeit in a different way than in other virtual currencies like Bitcoin? So Bitwalking needs its users to regulate themselves, I think, to make their actions or steps, in this case, algorithmically readable. If a step must be algorithmically perceivable to be economically viable, it seems to me that this regulation process must become embodied in those who take part in Bitwalking's alternative financial ecosystem. So some of the next steps of this research may be um, to follow how users incorporate this work of maintaining the integrity of Bitwalking's financial ecosystem into their daily lives and embodied experience. So those are the two tensions that I'm um, exploring through this project on Bitwalking. Um, the tension between the universality and locality of the activities that generate the currency and the tension between uh, the openness and control of the currency's financial ecosystems and the way that that control is embodied. So to conclude very briefly, just have a couple more minutes, um, I'd like to sort of place this interest in the economies in which bitwalking circulates within the scope of my broader research on the economies of self-tracking data and practices. So the kinds of questions that I'm interested in asking through this project revolve around what is produced and mobilized beyond data and beyond the self as data. Um, what power structures are reproduced in both visible and especially in invisible ways. Um, how are daily practices embedded in local realities, such as having to walk farther to get to work? How are those lived experiences, um, lived realities, mobilized for capital? And in other parts of the project, more so than in this bitwalking case, but I'm also interested in how the generation and cultivation of self-knowledge and self-care through self-tracking, how these are mobilized for capital, and in particular, how self-tracking as a form of self-investment in, in one's future um, participates in the construction of whiteness and of white self-possession. Um, so I've really appreciated some of the, the previous discussions on the last panel around that. Um, one of the last panels. Um, and I'm also asking how the self is put into relation with others as part of its participation in these self-tracking economies. Um, so through metrics that categorize us and place us in comparison or in competition um, with others and with ourselves, I think that can be especially true in, in some of the labor discipline aspects of self-tracking. Um, and throughout all of this, I'm trying to focus on how that differential assignation of value, again, along lines of class and gender and race and location, um, how that's a constitutive part of these economies rather than something secondary. Thanks very much. Uh, I, uh, I come from a slightly different background from most of you. I'm not a social scientist. I'm an artist and I teach uh, in an art school. So, uh, but I'm kind of very interested in how artists use data and um, and uh, with kind of with the art world obsession with data currently. So I want to start my presentation with actually uh, referring to two big exhibitions that happened uh, last year. First of them uh, is Big Bang Data that happened in London at Somerset House. And the second one is Data in the 21st Century, which was hosted by V2 Institute uh, in Rotterdam, Netherlands. And I want to kind of actually start with a quotation from um, uh, kind of from this uh, kind of uh, exhibition catalogs. So uh, I will start with Big Bang Data, uh, and they start the catalog in a kind of very optimistic or kind of observational way in which they say, quotation, across the world, a generation wakes and reaches for laptops, tablets, and smartphones to find friends, share news, learn of parties, meetings, artists, lovers, school. As they do so, every click is tracked, grafted, and banked, recommendations offered, trends announced, advertising recalibrated, the flows of information tweaked, the revenue stream maximized, reality adjusted. And then uh, later on, they kind of uh, talk a bit more about the sinister kind of nature of this kind of constant data flow, and they say, quotation, Overnight, the software agents seed in the dark pools of electronic environments, visibly only on computer screens and glittering towers of finance. They compete, evolve, and reproduce at millisecond speeds, predate and parasitize upon each other, learn from every attack and invasion. Dependent on their desperate struggle, the value of factories, commodities, and people, race, and fall. 
suddenly a million homes are worthless. So end of quotation. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, kind of they kind of try to kind of really kind of uh, emphasize that data is money and data is power, and that data is everything, and that everything can be data. Uh, yet data is simply a set of information on a world that is very messy, rational, unstable, and emotional. So. Um, in the kind of catalog for the data in the 21st century exhibition, the curator states that, quotation, the rise of the so-called big data and the emergence of technologies that are able to quantify our every move, preference and behavior, have demonstrated where the friction lies between the unpredictable reality that we live in and the desire to capture it in data. And I'm also precisely interested in these dichotomies and how data and uh, remembering or memory uh, intersect. So um, uh, to today I will kind of actually concentrate on the work of Igor Strohmeyer, who is a pioneer um, of net art. So s some of you who are kind of familiar with net art history, you would know the work of uh, Igor Strohmeyer. And uh, all of his work, uh, or, or actually most of his work, is available on his uh, kind of web-based platform, which he calls Intima uh, Virtual Base. And, uh, and he kind of describes Intima as a web-based fictional biography of an astronaut. So he is kind of um, uh, out there. <laughs> uh, he describes himself as an uh, intimate mobile communicator. And in an interview, he says that, uh, quotation, I want to create projects on the net that the visitor can emotionally communicate with. The project would have to inspire an emotional response. So he or she would not think about what is on the screen or in the speakers. I feel like a sculptor. It is really emotional for me to write HTML code. I do it manually. I do not use special software for this because I f really feel so romantic creating something with my fingers. So, um, uh, however, uh, I mean, Igor is kind of using quite a lot of sarcasm in his work and in kind of how he defines his work, uh, which is kind of quite, uh, I'm sure you can kind of sense that in his statements as well. But uh, today I want to talk about a project that he did in 2011, uh, which is called Expunction. So between 11th of May and 16th of June, Strohmeyer carried out a ritual expansion of his classic net projects, which he created between 1996 and 2007. And every day during that period, he deleted one net art project and he removed it permanently from his server so that the projects are no longer available on the Intima virtual base. And he completely deleted 37 net art projects, uh, which totals 3,288 files or bear yourself 101 megabytes. So that's 11 <laughs> years of work uh, collected in 101 megabytes. It just kind of shows how actually this kind of hunger for data is growing. <laughs> uh, so uh, in an introductory essay for the special issue of performance research on technology and memory, Michael Blicker reminds us that the desire to remember and share every single detail of one's life has a name and it's called live logging or live catching and is practiced by tens of thousands of people all over the world. And this kind of practices exemplify what Heisen calls mnemonic fever, an obsession with recording, memorization and fashioning of the self through photographs, videos, blogs, uh, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, the now in this kind of uh, trend appears to shrink in the face of the ever-increasing speed of technological developments uh, while the past kind of grows and with it the fear that all will eventually disappear and be deleted. So with his kind of ritual expansion of his own projects, Strohmeyer raises questions about temporality, duration and availability of what is accessible on the internet and how this impacts on the way in which things are remembered. So deleting his project was not meant as a kind of aggressive or destructive act. Rather, Strohmeyer believes that memory is here to deceive us. And he says in relation to this project, hence, once they are published, the deleted artworks or their remaining fragments, which can no longer be deleted due to the dispersal and the fragmentation of the World Wide Web, tell us much more about their originals than the originals themselves. So, uh, end of quotation. So, we live in a society in which everything is recorded, and a lot of speakers talk about that, so I will kind of not expand on that. Uh, uh, but uh, also society 
which kind of will remind us uh, of our past actions and um, it will make it impossible for us to escape them. The fact that the internet never seems to forget is what Jeffrey Rosen observed in his kind of work. And he says, quotation, it's often said that we live in a permissive era, one with infinite second chances. But the truth is that for a great many people, the permanent memory bank of the web increasingly means that there are no second chances, no opportunities to escape a scarlet letter in your digital past. Now, the worst thing you've done is often the first thing everyone knows about you. End of quotation. So I think that Rosen here argues that uh, the delete should be made obligatory. And uh, for example, by means of kind of expiration data or dates on information posted on the internet or by means of technology. So there is kind of software that he suggests that you can use, which is called Vanish, that makes electronic data self-destruct after a specific period of time. Uh, and uh, there is uh, an artist who kind of in a way responded to this uh, kind of software Vanish. Her name is Gordana Savicic and as part of her project Web2 Suicide Machine, she enabled the users of the social network to erase their entire profile to secure their right to privacy and free management of digital life. So uh, both Vanish and uh, Gordana Savage project work with the issues of persistence of online identity or the memory of the online identity in social networks. And, and this is becoming a major legal question. So I, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with this and especially in cases of sudden death or abuse. And I think that Bihaj uh, mentioned that yesterday. So uh, sometimes grieving family members and friends would no doubt be aghast to come across a nasty comment about departed loved one on their Facebook pages or see a troll attacking their Twitter accounts. And we kind of see more and more cases like that. For example, last year in UK, there was the case of Jessica Lanny, at, uh, actually a teenager who committed a suicide due to Twitter trolling. And even after her death, uh, her Twitter account was trolled. So and also kind of uh, kind of also the uh, parents of uh, the child who was abducted kind of um, many years ago in Portugal McCain parents are kind of repeatedly trolled on their Facebook and Twitter accounts with kind of accounts of people seeing their daughter so it's kind of like very problematic and I think that as morbid as it may sound, uh, uh, there are a lot of lawyers and web, web experts who are urging people to include specific instructions in their wills about what happens to the digital footprint they leave. Uh, Robert Roda, who is a dispute resolution lawyer in Los Angeles, says that uh, in a New York Times article, that in an age where digital data has increasing economic and sentimental value, it is sensible to leave clear instructions in your will about what should happen to, for example, social media content after that. And now I think that Facebook, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but now on Facebook in the privacy settings, you can choose actually who have the right to change or alter your kind of Facebook page. Um, so you kind of choose who will after your death. Um, and strongly encourage you to do it. <laughs> this again brings us to Strohmeyer and his decision to delete 37 projects as part of expansion. So unsentimentally, he states that quotation art is a dirty job, but somebody got to do it. And uh, I think that this statement kind of works very much with kind of Nietzsche's argument that we should actively forget. Uh, or kind of if I kind of refer to my theater background, uh, and back at that we are flayed alive and tortured by memory. And uh, I think that what has to be cultivated is the attempt to forget the ways in which we've been programmed as memory machines. Uh, Strohmeyer argues that we deal with a computer as just as intimate as with our own body, and some of the speakers today mentioned that as well. And he consequently argues that the intimacy and privacy are becoming more and more publicly displayed, exhibited, shown. And quotation, he says, with the intense use of the internet, all our private and intimate acts and thoughts are also being noted down, registered, and even archived on servers and in various databases. And since our private life is becoming so very public, it affects also the structure and the systematization of the public sphere itself. That is why the public and political is becoming so personal, individualized, and consequently confused, more and more under pressure of so many different truths and also displaced and disorganized." End of quotation. So I think that this piece is a performance of self-control self by erasure. 
this is a bit in commentary on the deceptive strategies of kind of uh, commercial social media. It should be clear to everyone that the data does not in fact float out in the ether, but is collected within immense server farms. The harmless cloud imagery that we see around us, with its kind of almost fairy tale aesthetics, is designed to distract from the reality that cloud computing actually means allowing commercial interests access to personal data, since data saved in cloud services can be accessed by third parties. So the expansion project raises the question of duration and accessibility of net artworks that automatically change over time as the hardware and software changes. So br browsers change, players change, some of the early net artwork you can't see it anymore because it's just not watchable, the technology had changed so much. So uh, it slowly loses functionality and consequently content. So I think that the artist's basic premise in this project was that whoever creates programs and composes art is also entitled to deprogram, deconstruct, and delete. In a way, Strohmeyer has erased history, including his own personal history, since he believes that our memory serves to deceive, to betray us, to misrepresent rather than paint and describe the past. With its empty slot and precise documentation, a non-existent work, or rather its absence, points out the ephemerality of net artwork, telling at the same time much more about the deleted work than the so-called actual original, as he mentioned. So in a more recent work, uh, like uh, uh, is shown here in um, kind of Ego Massage or the Peace Embroidery, or this piece that I'm showing here, Multifeminist Studies, Strohmeyer takes a completely different approach to memory and extends his critical approach to kind of data. How am I with time? Okay, cool. Superficially, the images he's creating are bizarre, as you can see from here. Even kitsch, conglomeration and duplication of images like those with which we are more than familiar from internet-related advertising or historical photography. So his project, Multifeminist Studies, works with what Heidi Cooley calls autobiometry. Cooley claims that mobile imaging is informed by an autobiographical impulse and thereby belongs to a long tradition of first-person forms of documentation. However, she argues that the character and function of this emerging mode of self-record have undergone a shift. No longer governed by a narrative logic, mobile imaging is invested in the accumulation and recombination associated with a database logic. So this self-documentation coincides with or is articulated through what Ito described as a new kind of personal awareness. Strohmeyer in his projects engages in mobile imaging and proliferate various but particular images. These images, often in extreme close-up, are suggestive of an immediacy of experience and they're kind of traces of moments of potential encounter. So, uh, uh, Strohmeyer uh, is again in this project openly displaying his disillusionment with the social media and internet in general. In an interview with Annette Decker, he states that, quotation, Internet was dystopia from the very beginning. Nowadays, it is even worse, because the internet is, as everything else, becoming so commercialized. I would not put so much hope and pressure on the internet, because it is just one of the essential and much needed tools for our modern life. The so-called social media are fictitious too. All, the wa all they want is our money. It is just another game of the capital to make us believe we communicate more directly and more personally. So uh, the series of projects lack words, but abundant in irony, provocation, and perversiveness. I'm left wondering how these images will change over time and slowly but persistently lose their utility uh, and accordingly their content. I think it is timely to kind of finish this with a small quote from Simon Crutchley, and uh, I will show you a short clip from a mo uh, the most recent work of Strohmeyer. So Simon Crutchley says in a kind of theater of memory in uh, uh, that book, Quotation, every year, year in New York, on September the 11th, there is the 9-11 memorial event at Ground Zero, and the names are read out again, and you'll hear the first few, and that the cameras will switch to something else, or you'll lose interest. There is something to the listing of names which produces a kind of obliteration, because you can't take it in, it becomes a list. I don't want the dead to be forgotten, but there is a sense in which the way we enforce remembrance produces obliteration, and it's counterproductive. Make love, not art. Do not expect me to do it for you. Art, 
do not expect me to do it for you. Art, do not expect me to do it for you. Make love, not art. Do not expect me to do it for you. Art, do not expect me to do it for you. Art, do not expect me to do it for you. This is to the to the woman who did the bit walking. Kara. Kara. Hi. Sorry, yeah. I, I, I didn't know your name. Yeah, I, this is kind of more question of clarification, just because it's beca it was such a striking example. It really reminded me of this other project that I've seen. I think UNICEF had kind of spearheaded where they were they developed um, a wearable that people could wear in the United States for the sake of making money to for underprivileged youth and. Uh, in Africa, they targeted it like that. Um, I'm just kind of uh, trying to understand, I couldn't tell from your presentation, how indeed does walking generate money? Is it just a fact? What, what is the point of encouraging people to walk or even uh, compensating people for their movement in that context that you describe? Yeah. How does that even sold in as an it's idea? It's very strange. Um, it's not so much that, uh, at least the way that they portray it, it's not so much that uh, the walking comes first and you're trying to pay people or give them, you know, allow them to generate this digital currency um, by, uh, it's not that you're trying to encourage them to walk, it's the virtual currency that comes first. So they're trying to democratize the virtual currency and they do that by replacing what's otherwise a kind of prohibitively expensive process in generating a virtual currency with something that they see as being much more accessible, and it is, um, which is generating step counting data. Um, because you can do that with a smartphone, which m more people in the countries they're targeting have than um, a, a powerful enough laptop. Um, in terms of how the actual, I mean, I'm not a, an expert in virtual currencies um, by any means. In terms of how that actually works, uh, I'm sure that there's a technical aspect that I'm missing, but I think it is also interesting in that it kind of lays bare how currencies work. Like, it makes me think of this um, Onion article from years ago that was something like, you know, entire world realizes currency is I a fiction and all the economies collapse or something like that. And it's sort of like, saying, you know, yeah, you're ta you have a group of people, it matters who's in and who's out, right? Like, it matters who's part of the euro and who's not, for example. Um, so you have to regulate it. And then there are tasks that are assigned to people and assigned value. So it, it's kind of laying bare how currencies work and then tapping into that and trying to allow it to be po accessible by more people. It's, it's certainly represented by them as purely philanthropic, as you put it. Um, they're collecting the data kind of secondhand, so I don't know how much, uh, and they're not very forthcoming, at least a bit, as far as I've seen, about what, what they collect and, and how, but, um, which isn't normal. Um, but they're, they're collecting it from an existing step counting app, like, Google Fit or something like that. Um, so I don't know how much, how detailed the data would be. Again, they're kind of using it to do something rather than using it the way that most, that Fitbit or Google or whoever would be using it to sort of drill down and use it for advertising, to construct advertising categories and things like that. Um, uh, they can use it with companies who have sort of, who have bought into the currency, like who have agreed to um, accept the currency. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, your presentation surely raises a lot of questions. And, and one of the questions is, have you found any indications that this is actually a hoax? 
<laughs> because uh, as a technologist, the concept does not make sense. It doesn't make sense commercially yeah, yeah. either. Uh, we just kind of make initial screening of it. It seems uh, dubious. Yeah, it is. And also from what you're describing, um, the, the stage they're at, it's like what they've uh, written about it. You can, you can basically write that in an afternoon if you take some buzzwords around virtual currencies. And, and the, and the, ba the <laughs> basic technical features of virtual currencies are not present here. And basically, the things that you, you do with Bitcoin, there's a, a fundamental thing called the proof of work, which is what all these computers do in a mm -hmm. network. You can't do that with steps. Yeah, well, so, that, so that's where that verification comes in, and it's causing them problems, well, I think. Well, I, I, thi I think you should really look into whether this is an art project. So I think it that there it are smells, it smells like it. two uh, yeah. things going on. It's I don't think it's an art project, although that would be great. Um, there, there, is a, there is a hoax version, which is uh, called Bitcoin, isn't mm -hmm. there? Which I think is a hoax, but yeah. But so I think there are maybe two things going on. And again, like I'm no expert in, in um, Bitcoin or other virtual currencies, but um, one is that they are having problems. What I didn't get into is their, you know, their Facebook and Twitter feeds are just inundated with people complaining. Um, they're having problems. Like it doesn't really work, um, and that and some of what you brought up may be part of it. The other is that like you know after Bitcoin became popular, there was that inundation of um, all sorts of different virtual currencies because the attempt is to get in on the ground floor and to create a viable currency that then if you got in early, like it's a pyramid scheme. So it is a hoax in a way that they're kind of all, there's a hoax element or a maybe not hoax, but a pyramid scheme element to all of them. You're trying to get in before it gets huge so you can profit off of it. Um, so, so just may I just explain some things about, for instance, just step tracking, which makes, makes this seems very, very unlikely that it will ever work which is like they have made their own app and algorithm for step uh, tracking. They're, they're using, for instance, Google Fit. Yeah. And these algorithms, they are built on top of the accelerometers in the, in the mobile phones or in, in the wearables. And they're inferring whether certain accelerations could be interpreted as a step. Mm -hmm. And people, are, there are already now reports that people, they have putting their uh, Fitbits on darks mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to reach the 10,000 steps, right? So how are these guys going to verify oh, I don't the know. authenticity <laughs> of a step? And, 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 and currencies are all about authenticity and, uh, and being able to, uh, to uh, ascribe value to... Uh, to For sure. So yes, they are absolutely all about authenticity so, so and they I'm require like regulation. A, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm 100% sure, but I'm just saying I think you should look into it. Or else these mm -hmm. guys, they simply do not know what they're working with. And, and what you're telling us that they have this inundation of, of complaints might also be an indication. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I, I mean, I'd, I'll just jump in because I'm an annoying. But like, I, I, think I think they're incompetent, but I don't think it's a hoax. And I mm -hmm. don't think they wouldn't, it wouldn't be the first uh, financial system to be built on bullshit, <laughs> basically. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, the hoax is at the, the base of it, yeah. Yeah, it lays bare what a currency is, yeah. The, the US uh, housing market is. <laughs> All money is immaterial yeah. at the moment. <laughs> Do you think, um, oh, what's the name, Art Project, this is his That's name? Roman. Yes. <laughs> Do you think he's the sort of digital equivalent of uh, graffiti in some senses? <laughs> because uh, okay. art goes that way of temporal, contextual, just for a little bit, use it, abuse it, delete yeah. it, and it's part of its value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 definitely. I think that, I mean, um, I mean, there is no, uh, he's not anonymous, of course, but uh, I think that um, uh, I, there is that kind of element. I think it's kind of more about, uh, in especially kind of, I think that if you follow Igor Strohmeyer's work, he's one of the pioneers and in a way evangelist of kind of net art 
work and early internet work, artwork, uh, and um, and kind of and it's interesting kind of to f- also slowly follow his disillusionment with the medium and with kind of and the purpose of digital art. And I think that what what kind of for me what is kind of very fascinating is kind of his constant questioning of the of the medium as well. And um and I think that it kind of if you consider that this project was done in two thousand and eleven when there was kind of uh, kind of in a way this kind of whole obsession started and people were starting to kind of generate kind of massively data and I think that Tom kind of was talking a bit about kind of how he was also kind of pioneering this kind of devices because th- they didn't exist I think that he was kind of quite ahead of time to kind of say all right well actually I will delete everything I will because it is kind of obsolete to have this and I have ownership it won't be owned by anyone else it will be kind of I I created it. I will delete it. So I think that that kind of, for me, that is kind of the most appealing in terms of kind of to whom this data belongs and how, uh, kind of, how do we kind of share that? Uh, sorry, I just wanted to say that the the legal profession is catching up in some sense. So there is this yeah. thing about uh, the right to be forgotten. Yeah. That's becoming into new European legislation about yes. privacy. Yeah, yeah. I think it strikes a chord with that trend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I talked uh, just briefly about that because, I mean, I'm not a legal expert, but I know that now this becomes a big kind of uh, legal issue as well in terms of kind of, ha- kind of, uh, as you said, kind of what happened. I don't know if somebody's abused or somebody dies and kind of how that kind of information is handled is very sensitive. And I know that now kind of th- that legislation is kind of becoming more stronger in, in, in p- c- certain countries. But um, yeah. Yes, it's working. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I have a question for Chris. Um, thanks. It's uh, uh, it's very interesting and probably equally frightening. But uh, the um, I have a question from from the angle of one of the things you said uh, about. I think it was one of the first slides, the one that you then uh, got back to towards the end about this the sort of cue and then reward. Because um, one of the things that kind of a, a I find problematic not in in your presentation, but by looking at at the the things that you describe, uh, is that of course there is a, a sense that this is a kind of project to to uh, make sure that that the, the the worker embodies and kind of interiorizes the structure of of the order. But on the other hand, one may wonder whether those cues are actually a simple and implicit way to give orders as if it was a simply, you know, traditional workplace. I mean, it's just changing the nature in which orders are being issued from a top-down perspective by making use of the, techno- the very same technology that should make them happy. So I'm not sure if that makes sense, or it's more than a comment probably than a question, but, but it, it is, there is, I have a, the more I, I read and, and, and sort of listen to things like yours and that are emerging uh, in, that, in that context, there's a sort of implicit sense that of the order, you know, the, the, the digital app fosters a, an order. Really, it's not simply like engaging someone. It's a call to action. Marketers would call it a call to action. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, I, I um, talk about it in terms of employee engagement because that's that's how they talk about it, obviously. <laughs> and so I think it's good it's good to use the terms of the, the you know the people you're, you're looking at of how how they self. Self-describe, but I, I, I agree it is it is an ordering, um, um, but it's through a kind of uh, an integration, I think, of the subjectivity of the uh, uh, of the subject um, into that into that system uh, and and uh, and a reshaping of it. I, I don't know if it's successful particularly, but I think that, that, that that's the target. Or it's the, the, that kind of idealized uh, assumption, and that, it, yeah, absolutely, it, it it is an order, or it's it's um, it, it's an attempt to reshape so that the orders don't need to be given. I think almost um, that it's that it is automatic, um, and that's why I think it's interesting that that that, it, that or habit loop forming individual is node is placed within um, a network structure. So it's not a it's not not a top down. The the kind of almost the orders uh, seem to almost come naturally from the the structure of the network, although with a manager prodding bits of it to kind of um, restructure it slightly so so that certain ideas spread better than others. So, Chris, my my question is is about those programs as well. Um, you mentioned that 
this guy Charles du- Durick, he seemed to be a um, bit of a pop psychologist or whatever, management guru. I mean, it seems to me that all these things can be evaluated properly, right? This, I mean, it can be turned into some sort of scientific evaluation to see whether it does work, you know, this network effect, repo effect, or whether, I mean, has anyone done that? Um, I mean, yes, certainly, I mean, to some extent, the, um, certainly the network effect, I mean, Chris Darkis is actually more of a, a real kind of scientist, right. Duhigg is a journalist, but like, he, you know, yeah, he publishes in Nature and this kind of thing. Um, and obviously, I think there is certainly some, some truth to that. Um, and, and clearly he's got the kind of the evidence, the mathematical evidence suggesting. But what I'm more interested in, is I think it, it's presenting a certain kind of relatively idealised uh, sort of mathematical um, and networked ontology in the sense, uh, in that kind of way that I said, that it, it, it's, it's based on the fact that this, this idea of individuals as, as nodes, as atoms, um, rather than as <laughs> subjects, I suppose. Uh, and that it, it does work in some contexts. Um, on that way, but it, there's also lots of other things going on. He is representing um, a, a population as n- nodes and connections, um, and this is a this is a kind of a digital network ontology, um, and that's the point I was making. That if you if you, it, it's much easier to reduce the complexity of human life and relationships down to node and connection if you've got them digitally tagged um, in that way, because it produces those things for you. Uh, and it, and it's, it's the same, it's that kind of network ontology, which, which kind of goes back further than the digital and, and the internet, goes back to people like um, uh, Marino um, and kind of early 20th century kind of uh, network analysts. Um, but it is an idealised form. Uh, and I think that, that putting these devices on everyone is almost making that, that, that digital ontology real, in a way. <laughs> he, gets, he gets paid by Virgin Pulse to write these papers. Uh, and, I mean, he's a professor, uh, and he writes <laughs> academic articles, and his books solve a lot of copy. <laughs> so, I guess so. Yeah. He's in Vogue. He's in Vogue? Oh, no, it, it's oh I meant, I meant <laughs> the, the magazine. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, thank you. This question uh, is also for you. Um, I was thinking ho- how you described this individuals as uh, passive atoms. Mm. And there is uh, here, uh, in all this monitoring, um, a very clear Cartesian dualism between the the body or that which can be measured and the consciousness uh, ruling, making these decisions. And I was thinking, because what we heard yesterday also about this, uh, it's a certain kind of attunement. I think you you kind of pointed towards that now in, in this answer also, that there is a certain attunement maybe then also from the leaders towards that which can be measured in order to uh, manage it at its best <laughs> for everyone's gain, you, you see? But it's still built on a very strong uh, dualism. Uh, but have you been thinking more about the differences between uh, how we should understand this on an individual level and on a, this collective level? Is it the same dualism going? Or, or are there important differences? Um, that's that, yeah, that's a tricky question. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I think the the, the target of the, the, the things I was analysing, the kind of discourse I was analysing, is things that are, is aimed at the manager, um, the person who's going to intervene to restructure the network to get the effects which are positive, um, and or to to some extent the kind of the Charles Duhigg the habit loop thing is aimed at individuals managing themselves. Um, and I think that that's, that has become quite a, um, a common um, trope almost in, to some extent in self-tracking, but also in kind of more broadly kind of self-help things about managing your own desires or, or, or things. Or I'm the kind of person who's, uh, I'm a chocoholic, so I need to you know, manage myself, but, or I, I tend to overeat, so I need to get a little plate to eat off, otherwise I'll overeat, this kind of thing. It's, um, so I think it's quite a, it's a, there's a certain kind of managerialist ideology to it, perhaps, even on the individual level. Uh, that's not blanket terms and it's different in different contexts I think but certainly from some of these angles that's how it seems to me um, so yeah I'm not sure uh, hi yeah thanks for some 
three great presentations. Um, uh, I don't know if mine is a comment or a question, but it's about sort of this interesting relationship there's between Chris and Elena's talk, because Chris, you, um, as if I understand you correctly, you say that this sort of in that that um, that in this sort of organization or the labor that you describe, what is stolen is no longer uh, this simply la the labor power, but its subjectivity. Uh, and uh, then you, a bit after, <laughs> show this all these sort of virtual this sort of suicidal network uh, pieces of art, and you could say that in this situation that you describe. Chris, that 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 the um, that labor is already a kind of death sentence, and the only refusal suggested by Liliang and Visible in, in in the artwork you show is is therefore the sort of um, the refusal to operate under these conditions, the, meaning suicide. And I have a quote here from Franco Berardi, who also says that suicide is the decisive political act of our times. Um, so, if I was to pose this as a question, it, it would be, what are the kinds of responses to the situation that you describe, Chris? The, a situation where, where sort of what's stolen is not just the labor power, but our very subjectivity. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I. I don't know. I mean, you kind of you kind of summarized in a way what I think that I I I agree with you. I think that these are acts of resistance in a way by by, by the artists to um, uh, uh, kind of um, this uh, uh, kind of almost like n fever to remember and to kind of uh, measure everything. And um, I mean, I. Um, I think for me, it's kind of what is kind of more interesting is that uh, they're kind of addressing uh, kind of something which kind of kind of profoundly follows humanity, and that is kind of our memory and how kind of our kind of um, capacity to memorize things have kind of changed with kind of technologies that we have now. So kind of if I kind of count how many pictures I have from my childhood, kind of yeah, maybe I don't know, twenty, thirty pictures, uh, I have like minimum 2000 pictures of my children <laughs> and they're kind of and they're six you know so it's kind of like um it just kind of uh, we talk a bit about kind of this kind of, and i don't know if i will ever kind of go back to all 2000 of those pictures you know i mean kind of like now arbitrary talking about that so um and uh and i kind of i i, I think that it is very important for us to kind of really discuss in every capacity what memory means for us now and w why do we need to memorize things because i think that we lost track of all, all of what, what what is the kind of philosophical underpinning of memory as well kind of what memory means for humanity because right now it is only kind of used for for measuring and is that the only thing that we need i mean i know that there are kind of examples where it can be kind of quite um used for different kind of um positive kind of things but uh for me as an artist uh, uh it is very questionable kind of how we kind of philosophically connect with our memories now um yeah and i, I mean yeah i agree it's really it's tricky um i think and i agree uh, your summary was very good uh, and that's, that's roughly what i think um that it is it is about incorporating our kind of subjectivity into these processes because that is that is necessary for the functioning of capitalism. That's how capitalism works now. It doesn't just need your body; it needs your, you know, kind of um, knowledge, symbolic, semio-capitalism, knowledge economies, this kind of stuff. And um, so it is. It, it's a tricky kind of situation. And I think it, um, as someone, I think it's probably Berardi has, has talked about alienation in kind of Marx's time mm. was um, your becoming like a robot. Uh, literally become like an automaton, uh, uh, but you can always daydream uh, while you're at work. Um, but you can't really do that anymore because your consciousness has to be has to be uh, integrated with what you're doing. You you, you have to be uh, kind of uh, concentrating on things, um, and so it's it's hard to do that. But their their systems are always uh, still sort of quite mechanical. I think that that, that habit loop system mm -hmm. is, is still quite a mechanical kind of system, um, and it's still assuming a certain kind of um, mechanical or robotic kind of uh, approach, um, 
and it can be it can be resisted. We don't have to do it for a start, I suppose. Uh, and I hope suicide is not the only un answer. But um, <laughs> and a digital suicide. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of I want to also kind of add because you kind of reminded me beca that, bec that uh, because I think that there is kind of an if I go, go back to Simon Cratchley as well again, uh, I think that kind of when he talks about kind of this um, kind of the, the passive and the active nihilism that we kind of actively experience now. And um, and for me also kind of this whole kind of measurement identification, it is kind of in a way sometimes passive nihilism. So if active nihilism is, I don't know, kind of the terrorist attacks and ISIS and, and people who kind of go and kill other people for for whatever goal they have, because that's the only way to go forward. This kind of passive uh, kind of nihilism, it is kind of okay, so I will now kind of just track my body obsessively and forget about actually what is really happening around me. So I just, uh, and I feel that kind of in a way what kind of these artists at least are doing are kind of just kind of really kind of, um, uh, kind of tracking between those kind of forms and trying to kind of really uh, find a way forward. Although Strohmeyer is quite nihilistic as well, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions, please? Okay, one over there. <laughs> yeah, I just. I'm just struggling with this notion of memory um, because I can see the the obsession with putting all your photographs on Facebook and having a daily record of every tiny thing you do. But that surely isn't what an artist does. An artist is reflecting on that process or critiquing it. So wasn't his artwork a critique of that process? So why does he want to delete the critique of that process in order to critique that process? I'm I'm getting caught with his loop. I think that uh, I mean, um, uh, you know, uh, his early work is not about that. So the work that he deleted is not about that. His early work is very much about the, in a way, as I said, he's a pioneer of net art. He was kind of in a way evangelist of net art. So his early work is very much glorification of all the technologies. So in a way, what what he kind of you know, deleted was that kind of moment of his kind of artwork where he kind of in a way very much um, kind of um, uh, uh, embraced the technology as something which will take the humanity one step further. I think he still deeply believes that. What? <laughs> yes, maybe, yeah. <laughs> yes. No, I just think that actually it's a normal process, you know, I think that a lot of artists go through that, you know, it is kind of historically in art that is happening, a lot of artists kind of have moments when they destroy paintings, uh, you know, kind of like, I mean, Van Gogh is a kind of drastic example of that, I mean, he cut his ear in a kind of frantic uh, kind of uh, dissatisfaction with uh, his artwork and his private life, but uh, I, I feel that it is kind of part of that kind of subjective evaluation that and reflection that artists are going through in their kind of everyday life uh, because it is a reflective uh, art making is a reflective work yeah yeah no no I don't know if I am yeah I, I don't believe in experts <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That seems like a different way of trying to it's almost like trying to control a historical Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and he kind of commented in one of the statements that I read about that. I think that he kind of like, um, in a way, when he kind of, I, I don't know if I can find that now, I mean, it doesn't matter really, but it is kind of, um, I think he ki uh, very much talks a bit about kind of this disillusionment with the kind of the internet as a medium. And he says, um, kind of, uh, he talks quite a lot about his history and he says, oh, I come from ex-communist country and I know what propaganda is and what we are experiencing right now is very much, it's a propaganda. So I kind of decide for that reason to kind of really 
kind of not just delete my personal kind of to delete my personal artwork, which is in a way public. It is kind of belong to everyone in a way when you put it out there. So yeah, I think it is a conscious kind of political as well as kind of artistic decision. Well, actually, yeah, traces of it can be found because internet never forgets. So, <laughs> yeah, but th that's what he also kind of thinks, a bit, uh, kind of, I think it's an interesting proposition as well, that then he kind of leaves open this kind of assumption of what his art was and how it looked and how it can be kind of reintegrated or reinterpreted. Yeah. yeah, but I was going to ask, so did it work? So as a diagnosis of the world, did he actually succeed in making, uh, making us all forget? And you managed to answer my question just as I was about to ask it. But so, so how much is there left? Is it all gone or? Uh I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much is kind of left. I know that kind of from his database, everything is erased. But then as you know, kind of a lot of things kind of uh, are distributed and also because he kind of uses his database and then that can kind of be redistributed to different websites. So I'm not sure how much is left, but a good question to ask Igor. <laughs>